mention I'm a, a tax and public policy partner at Squire Paddy Boggs. Um, we're a firm of um, 1,500 lawyers uh, globally with 46 offices in uh, 20 countries. Um, and uh, my practice is, is fairly broad. I do um, some VAT, but I won't be, I'm sure, up to the technical standards of most of the people uh, in this uh, room. Um, but I have been finding myself uh, doing more and more in the field of VAT, particularly this year. I'm actually off to um, Oman and Bahrain uh, on Saturday, um, two countries that are, are looking um, to introduce VAT. They were intending to do it along with um, the UAE and Saudi Arabia on the 1st of January 2018. Um, they're not going to be able to do that. Um, uh, but we are certainly seeing um, VAT uh, becoming a, uh, a greater issue of importance across the, uh, the world. Um, and I also, um, helpfully, advise more broadly in relation to Brexit than just in the field of, of tax, um, looking at some of the broader public policy issues for clients in terms of their strategic planning in light of the decision that the UK took to uh, Brexit back in June 2016. Um, so I think I sit on a, a think tank uh, called uh, um, the Red Tape Initiative, uh, which is looking at various ways in which uh, the UK, after it leaves the EU, uh, can uncontroversially and on cross-party political lines uh, remove some of the regulation in order to encourage growth. And indeed, uh, growth is something that the UK does rather need at the moment. Um, one reason that you uh, didn't get my uh, slides uh, for this talk until about a an hour ago is that I was, uh, well, I'm partly a last minute guy anyway, but um, there was a, a budget uh, yesterday, our annual, um, meant to be annual, it sometimes comes more frequently, um, budget. Um, and uh, although there were some tax announcements, and I'll mention uh, one of those on VAT a little bit later in relation to the options that the UK has as a policy matter after it leaves the, um, uh, the EU, but the, the headline point was that the uh, UK, which uh, in living uh, memory has seen average growth of about 2% is uh, now going to be looking at growth of about 1.5%, uh, which means if you average that uh, over 50 years, the UK will be a, the economy will be a third smaller than it would have been had it been at that 2% uh, trend. And that is also significant in terms of the options uh, for the UK uh, after it, it, um, it, it leaves. I, I would say I don't think that... Uh, reduction in the growth forecast is wholly linked to, to Brexit, but as we'll see, because of the changes that will, will follow, including those in relation to VAT, there is likely to be less trade, there will almost certainly be less immigration, which has fueled growth in the UK um, for uh, at least um, five to ten years. Um, so that also plays into the decisions that the, the UK uh, will make. It is quite interesting in terms of doing this because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Brexit generally and I was trying to see how to link the, the broad stuff into the VAT discussion but actually they are in most cases um, uh, are linked. Uh, so um, first of all uh, I just want to apologise. Um, uh, it's lovely to have the excuse to come to Trier and uh, spend time with uh, uh, people like you, um, but I would rather we, we, um, we weren't here. Um, uh, that's not to say, uh, and it's interesting in terms of the way the debate now proceeds in the UK on Brexit, it's not to say that some of the criticisms of the EU from the UK perspective have not been entirely justified and that these needed to be resolved and there's been a failure of politicians in the UK and also in the EU uh, to, I can see someone taking a photo now of my slide. I'm now going to be held to this. And uh, a hate figure amongst uh, the 52% in the UK. But um, uh, the, there have been issues in relation to um, the UK's membership of the EU. And uh, while Theresa May, in the speech that she gave in Florence, was criticised by some in the UK and beyond for saying that the UK had never really felt part of the EU in the way that uh, the French and the Germans and others feel part of the EU. I think there is some, some truth in that. And it's been interesting that with some of the discussion earlier today about the uh, 
uh, the treatment of, of um, that treatment of, of things like um, nappies and um, women's sanitary products and, and, and so on. Um, and um, there is a, a sense, that that's just a microcosm of a wider issue about the perceived, and I think in some ways, actual democratic deficit within the EU, uh, which did give rise to the sort of forces that we saw, and there were other reasons as well, but in part the forces that led to the narrow uh, win for uh, the Leave campaign uh, in the uh, referendum. Um, but that said, and while I personally I could see myself in a different campaign on a different question, potentially looking to um, see the UK with a different relationship to the EU to that which it, it currently has. It was the wrong referendum at the wrong time with the wrong leader uh, and uh, indeed in the end the wrong result. And I'm sorry uh, about that and uh, not to over egg the point, uh, but I did uh, vote to remain. But um, we are where we are. So a little bit of history uh, just to go over. Uh, why we are um, now here. The referendum held on 23rd June 2016, uh, very few people thought uh, that Leave uh, would uh, win, uh, but they did with nearly 52% uh, of the vote. Um, they're then led, and I don't know how many people followed the sheer hilarity of the uh, David Cameron resignation uh, followed by the Conservative uh, leadership campaign. Um, I won't go into it now. There are some good books out there uh, which are really very readable about um, how Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and Andrea Leadsman all uh, fell apart um, and then uh, Theresa May within a very short period of time uh, won uh, the uh, leadership race and in turn became uh, Prime Minister. Now Theresa May didn't vote to uh, leave the EU. Uh, she voted I think we can say this with, with some certainty. She did vote to remain, um, but um, she, was, um, she pretty much set out uh, the campaign. And this also, I think in part because she won as a, uh, as a politician who was not a lever, that pushed us to decisions, which mean that we are now uh, in a lot of places, but in a particular place uh, that we're going to focus on to today in relation to to VAT. And one thing she did in her conference speech in 2016 was to announce that uh, the UK uh, would trigger Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty by the end of March 2017 um, and we would start the process to leave uh, the EU. And um, there were a number of reasons for that, but one of those was that um, there was at that time a, um, a case being brought in the courts. Uh, the government took the view that it did not need to get an act of parliament to be able to trigger Article 50. Um, the case was taken on the basis that it, uh, they did, and indeed it turned out in January that was correct, um, but uh, an act was forced through, or I'd say forced through, it was pushed through parliament uh, with very uh, little opposition, which I think also was a, uh, a mistake on both sides, and again leads us into this position where we have a lack of clarity on both sides uh, right now. Um, Theresa May gave her Lancaster House uh, speech in January 2017, and that was a speech in which she made clear that there were four red lines for the UK. Uh, we would leave single market, the customs union, uh, no longer be subject to the jurisdiction of the ECJ, very important that one, we'll come back to that later, and uh, control of our, our borders. Um, Article 50 uh, triggered following the Act of Parliament on the 29th of March. Uh, and then, um, well, we just uh, won't go into any detail on the general election, uh, but that happened. And uh, if people can buy me very strong alcoholic drinks later, I will tell you all about uh, the consequences of that. Theresa May remains Prime Minister, goes to Florence for reasons that still are unfathomable to give a speech um, uh, to um, try and move the so-called divorce talks along and um, uh, mention money, uh, mention a few things on EU citizens' rights, but it doesn't really uh, proceed um, all that quickly. Um, and um, 
it did also, uh, that speech, I suppose, importantly for, for that purposes, uh, as well as other purposes, acknowledge that two years was too short a time to be able to um, get to uh, certainly a trade deal. I mean, to be honest, even with a transition, it's too short to get to a trade deal. But in terms of just doing the things like getting the, the, the customs uh, posts um, ready, it was just impossible to do that within the time, so there would need to be a, a transition um, period. Uh, so where are we right now? Huh. See, this is the point I was trying to um, you know, hold back writing because it, it does change pretty much from day to day. What, one of the paradoxes of advising on Brexit, on looking, analysing Brexit, is that in a way nothing really changes. Okay? The EU has been pretty clear uh, before the referendum, immediately after, when the UK triggered Article 50 on what its positions have been, and pretty much the EU has, has won on those positions. And the UK hasn't really made any progress towards saying what it, it wants, including uh, in relation to, to VAT. And yet, things do move very quickly in, in the UK, which is Brexit-obsessed, as opposed to non-UK countries, with the exception of Ireland, where it, it doesn't, doesn't really feature. So we've had, uh, earlier this week, this question about um, Angela Merkel, weaker than had been expected, but it, you know, it doesn't really matter, uh, because the German position is, is pretty much um, set, in, set in stone anyway. Um, so we are at a position where there is a, another crunch point in December which will indicate whether the UK is going to um, give some indication as to whether the UK is going to crash out of the EU without a deal. We'll get on to what that might mean in a bit. Uh, or whether there will be progress on the three um, important key issues of um, the money, citizens' rights, and um, an Ireland. And um, uh, if I'd been um, uh, reasonable to our wonderful um, hosts and organisers and got them uh, the slides before 12 o'clock today. So if I'd done it last week, two weeks ago, I'd probably have um, put in there that I thought there was a less than a 50% chance of making sufficient progress in December. It does appear that both the UK and the EU think there's now slightly better than 50-50 chance that sufficient progress uh, will be made on those uh, three issues. The money, the, the, the money is, you know, what it is, and it looks like the UK will offer 40, 50 billion, and he's probably going to be okay with around that. The citizens' rights is eminently manageable, and a deal could have been done on these things uh, over the summer. Uh, so the UK has frankly wasted its time posturing when it doesn't have time on its side. Um, the Irish question, and this is very important for VAT, is really incapable of, of resolution. I mean, we can be as creative as we like. Um, but there is a, 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 a real problem in how you resolve that. It sounds like the intention is to try and park that, say we all know it's very complicated. There is an understanding that until there's clarity on the, on the trade deal, trade deal including customs and VAT, that we don't really know how we're going to resolve the Irish issue. So there is some understanding in terms of, let's say, the EU26 and the UK, that we can slightly park that. The only sting is that the Irish have upped the ante a little bit in recent weeks um, as regards Ireland, so that may um, hold things up. <coughs> so that's, that's the relationship between the UK and the EU. Uh, within the UK, uh, we have the European Union Withdrawal Bill, previously called the Great Repeal Bill, which is working its way through, uh, through Parliament at the moment. Um, so the EU withdrawal bill is um, intended to repeal the 1972 U European Communities Act, which is the act which um, governs our uh, relationship with the EU, and it ends the jurisdiction of the ECJ uh, in, the, um, I in the UK. Um, and I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, but it was understood at a fairly early stage, and this is why the name the Great Repeal Bill didn't really work. It was quite the opposite. Because so much EU law has direct effect in the UK, there needs to be some way of ensuring that we actually have a functioning legal system 
after we leave the EU. So the way in which that is done has been to propose, and it's really the only way it can be done, to have a snapshot of uh, EU law on the date that we leave, say 29th of March 2019. And that becomes part of the, the corpus of, of UK law, and then you can get some divergence after that, um, after that period. So that's the idea, and there are some issues, again, we'll get into those. Um, the intention is that after the UK leaves the EU, that um, you know, red line, ECJ jurisprudence won't apply, but judges will have a, a wide discretion as to how they apply ECJ decisions in the future, both in relation to uh, indirect tax, direct tax, and, and, and other matters. And the judges are saying, well, kind of what, what does that mean exactly? It's not unusual for um, uh, UK judges to look at um, jurisprudence in other jurisdictions to see how other learned uh, uh, counsel have argued and learned judges have decided um, cases. But it seems to be going a little bit further than that. And we'll look at an example in relation to uh, VAT again a little bit later. Um, one practical issue and this may have um, played a part in a recent Supreme Court case, which is also significant, is the, the timing. Um, so at the moment, we are still a member of the, the EU, and uh, courts are entitled to make referrals on uh, points of EU, EU law. They're obliged to, in certain cases, to the ECJ. The uh, problem is that um, you could make a referral as a court now uh, as a domestic court to the ECJ and you're not going to get an answer back. So what happens if a court refers now uh, but the decision, it, it doesn't come out till June 2019 or, or beyond? I mean, will the ECJ even, even hear the case? Um, um, what at that stage should the, the judge do? If it was referred before, should you look at a uh, sort of, should the discretion be exercised in favour of interpreting the ECJ decision um, almost completely. That's hard, though, because we're not meant to have ECJ jurisdiction at that stage. So that's a little bit, um, a little bit unclear at the moment. Uh, so a little bit about the, the various scenarios. I touched on the idea of, uh, of having uh, crashing out without a deal at all. Uh, and this breaks down into to two types of no deal. There's the what I call the no deal, no deal, and then there's the no deal deal. Uh, so the no deal, no deal is, is really just a, a fiction. I don't think any government minister really thinks, or even an extreme Brexiteer really thinks that would happen. This seems to be the case where uh, David Davis walks out of the talks in December. We say, right, we're not doing any, any deals with you uh, whatsoever, and we're going to prepare to be this little island in the Atlantic. Um, the issue with that sort of deal, no deal, is that uh, that's the scenario that genuinely stops the planes from flying. Right? It's, it's a, a, a matter of law. You, know, you won't have the aviation agreements. You can't fly uh, into and out of the, the UK in that scenario. Um, and um, I don't think there may be, you know, there may be a little bit of um, disruption. It's quite possible that come April, 2018, when the airlines have to start publishing their timetables for March 2019, that they'll be unable to do so. But very few people think that there won't be some sort of deal on, on aviation. There might, yeah, might not be. We, this is uncharted territory for all of us. It's, it's, it's possible. One of the th something someone said to me is the problem with the British is we think history is something that happens to other people. Um, we, we don't know where, quite where this, this takes us. So that's the no deal, no deal. Um, and obviously on, on VAT, the UK becomes a third country uh, uh, under that um, uh, uh, scenario. Then you've got the, the, the no deal deal, which I think means that you don't do a trade deal. So this is the idea that the UK, EU uh, would start trading on WTO terms. Um, but... Um, otherwise, you do the deal on the, on the things like um, aviation, and you do a deal on, on customs posts as well. So you don't do a broader tra trade deal. You don't do a specific deal in relation to VAT that treats the UK any differently from any other third country. Um, but um, you, you put the agreements in place to ensure that you can 
have dealings, have business, have some sort of trade uh, in, in place between uh, the UK and the EU. Um, fourth possible scenario is that the UK joins EFTA uh, or the EEA, um, very unlikely because of the red lines um, and frankly again we've left it a little bit late if that was a uh, direction that the UK wanted to go down. Um, query whether practically it, it was um, given um, that it doesn't in many ways fundamentally change the relationship between uh, the UK and the EU in a way that uh, the um, typical voter for, um, for leave, or indeed, because I don't want to be patronising, the typical voter for remain would really see the, the, major, the major difference. Um, if the cultural reasons behind Brexit were for the UK to be able, and I personally I think this is a, a hopeless fiction, but the idea that the UK can, outside the EU, look, look to uh, establish its role uh, in the wider world, um, then the EEA doesn't really enable you to, to, to do that. And the final scenario, which again I think is very unlikely, but many things are very unlikely uh, under Brexit scenarios, is that uh, we revoke the notification Article 50 and we, we uh, remain in the EU. Uh, either we do that in lieu of a transition, um, the view that it really does take longer than two years or four years to um, sort out our, our exit. Effectively, both sides would have to admit that the Article 50 uh, procedure doesn't work. Um, but um, for various political um, reasons, I, the only way I can foresee this happening is that if come January 2019, it, it does a, appear that, that the UK would be in an absolutely dire situation if it um, left the EU, then it's possible uh, we could see revocation. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we just carry on as we were on the 22nd of June. Um, that would uh, require both the UK and the EU to ask some, some pretty fundamental questions of each other and for the UK to raise um, some pretty um, fundamental problems with its political institutions. So the, you know, the problem is with this is the UK doesn't exactly know what it wants um, out of, um, out of Brexiting, um, and that was a fault of both sides uh, on the campaign and uh, the acts of mainly UK politicians uh, since it. So just to scoot over this, tax generally in the UK way per perceived in relation to the EU, uh, on the, uh, taxes other than VAT, um, it's had a, taxes had a significant, um, or Europe has had a significant impact on the design of the UK uh, system, um, uh, for example, uh, dividend exemption, CFC uh, reform, grouping. Um, in fact, the reason the UK is now not a bad jurisdiction in which to have a holding company largely comes out of the fact that the, um, in the 90s and 2000s, um, the ECJ kept telling us that our, um, our system wasn't compliant and we had to change it. And we started to change it, and with the numerous double tax treaties the UK has, it became a, a pretty good, um, a pretty good uh, country uh, in which to establish international operations in a way it certainly wasn't in the, um, the 80s and virtually all of the 90s and the first part of this century. Um, leaving will have uh, an impact on the applicability of certain uh, directives, um, US tax treaties, um, certain slightly unusual groups could uh, change their operation. Um, but um, the UK generally is, has been looking to um, move away from uh, taxing corporates uh, directly um, and looking more towards uh, VAT. So in relation to, to VAT, um, I think it's fair to say as well that the ECJ has um, impacted VAT and the way that VAT works in the UK. Um, one case that, that ended up not impacting because the Supreme Court reversed the decisions of the High Court and the Court of Appeal, uh, a case from about three or four weeks ago uh, involving Littlewoods, uh, which is a um, uh, company that um, I don't think still has uh, catalogue sales, but um, certainly in the uh, 70s and 80s, 
uh, was a, um, a company uh, which would send catalogs and you'd order uh, various bits and pieces um, uh, and give it to a, uh, an agent who would then um, supply the goods um, to you. And the case relates to, I mean, even for us as VAT specialists, the question of the calculation of compound interest on overpaid VAT is, is slightly esoteric. Um, but uh, the calculation in the case of Littlewoods, who had um, mistakenly accounted for VAT on these commission payments to agents, uh, when you added um, uh, the compound interest in the way they thought uh, that EU law um, required you to do, because it was pretty clear that UK VAT Act didn't require for the interest to be uh, computed in a particular way. Uh, so it, it would have provided an extra £1.25 billion uh, pounds, uh, to Littlewoods. And uh, the question went to DCJ, which came back to say um, that, um, well, <laughs> it was very unclear. I mean, the High Court, the Court of Appeal, <laughs> sort of thought they said, yes, you have to apply count and interest and pay Littlewoods £1.25 billion. And the Supreme Court... In a judgment, I must say, I haven't um, uh, the will to read in, in huge detail. Uh, but they basically said, no, the Court of Appeal and the High Court misunderstood what the ECJ said. Uh, and uh, the calculation that was, uh, HMRC had come up with was the, was the correct one. And um, because there had been a number of protective claims put in, um, uh, it would have cost the HMRC about um, £17 uh, billion. Um, which is, I think, about 10% of the annual amount raised by VAT, uh, had the Supreme Court decided that the ECJ had said what the High Court and the Court of Appeal thought the ECJ um, had said. And um, I've actually, despite the fact that I, I voted to remain uh, in, the, in the EU, it seems to me this is a perfect example. If you want to make a case in the UK or anywhere else, about um, the interaction between ECJ jurisprudence and, um, and domestic jurisprudence, it's, it's a pretty good one um, because um, it's not an unreasonable position to take that if the UK government wishes to calculate um, uh, interest to be paid as compensation on overpaid tax should be as stated in the VAT Act, then it's really none of the business of the ECJ. Uh, how it does it the other way. No? Not saying I necessarily agree with that point of view, but you can see that, uh, that argument. Um, and that's something which um, I would have thought uh, after we leave uh, the, uh, the EU that if a similar issue in relation to the calculation of compound interest were to uh, be decided by the ECJ after... March 2019 or March 2021, depending on how that transition period works, that would be something to which the Supreme Court would have um, no, um, would take no notice of. Um, transitioning to VAT after Brexit should, on the face of it, from a legislative point of view, be quite a straightforward area, I think. Um, the VAT Act 1994 deals with sales within the UK sales from UK, EU, and the other way, and sales to um, third countries. So most of it, again, I, I haven't done a line-by-line -line analysis of the, of the VAT Act, but you can just kind of ignore the bits that talk about uh, the UK and, and the EU, and it should hold together in the same way that it does for um, dealings with uh, the US and with, um, with China. Um, what I think the, the UK will have um, some flexibility to do after it leaves um, the, uh, the EU is to look at um, changing um, rates. Uh, and we've, we've discussed this a bit earlier about the multitude of rates that we see across uh, the EU and within um, countries. Um, and this has been something which uh, the government, indeed, Philip Hammond, yesterday in his budget, again, my excuse for not doing my slides and notes on time, um, he did make reference to uh, Northern Ireland and the tourism industry, because at the moment, um, Northern Ireland hotels have to charge the rate of tax 
um, and Republic of Ireland applies a 9% uh, rate of VAT, which means that people will stay in Ireland rather than Northern Ireland on, on holiday. Um, and you can't at the moment have differential rates within a country. Uh, so the Chancellor has said, and he, though he didn't mention Brexit specifically in relation to it, he mentioned April 2019 and looking at um, applying a lower, uh, a lower rate. Um, I may get onto it if we have time later, but in terms of the policy, a lot of people in the UK who do VAT think that there will be a lot of pressure on the government at the time, particularly in the immediate aftermath of, um, of Brexit, to um, have little giveaways through the VAT system for different sectors. Um, you know, and who knows, I might be representing some of those sectors asking the government to give us give us those. It's a nice thing populist politicians like to tinker uh, with rates and without the auspices of the EU to say, well, you know, it's not a good idea, you shouldn't be doing it, then that's exactly the sort of thing um, that we're likely uh, to do. Um, I don't think that we would change VAT radically, too radically anyway, not least because it, it does contribute such a, an enormous amount to the, the coffers um, so we can't be looking at um, reducing uh, tax too much uh, in terms of things like uh, VAT rates. So the, the potential um, burden uh, is the move from um, acquisition VAT to, um, uh, to import VAT on imports from the, the EU um, and the concern that companies will now need to move towards um, financing that import VAT in the way that they don't have to uh, at the moment. Um, and it may be that the UK uh, will introduce some sort of system to enable um, at least cer certain businesses to um, uh, effectively to treat the import VAT as if it were acquisition VAT by deferring it but clearly that's not going to work for, for all businesses because the risk of, of fraud um, is, is pretty, pretty marked. Um, uh, so that, that potentially causes a distortion to a system where, where at the moment, at least till 2022, there's no VAT on the cross-border uh, trade of goods. Um, businesses, uh, both in the UK and the EU, will need to, to change their, their tax and their accounting systems to deal uh, with... Uh, the change, um, but the issue that we're finding, um, and this goes not just in relation to VAT, but across the broader Brexit uh, advice that Squire Patton Boggs is providing to clients, is again, we're getting at that point now. Over the summer, there was an expectation that there would be some movement, some granularity as to what was going to happen. Maybe that seems naive now, but that's what we're expecting. And now we're getting to a, a stage where the businesses are saying, well, we really do need to know, and yet we're still at a, a, a stage where there are these three issues, the money, uh, citizens' rights, and, and Ireland, the Irish border, that are mean, meaning that we, we, we can't move to those systems because we don't know exactly um, what's going to happen. And again, you can see the mess of trying to do Brexit in this way because one of the points that the UK government has been making is that although they agreed to the... the um, to the staging of the talks in this way, but we're saying, well, the problem is we can't really um, resolve some of the issues in relation to Ireland until we know what the trading relationship is going to look like. We'll see the pictures of where the Irish border is um, a little later in the talk. But um, and, until we, we know what that, that trading relationship is going to look like, we don't exactly know what the VAT system is going to look like and the extent to which you're going to need um, uh, these, border, uh, these border checks. So that's one of the issues, particularly for, for Ireland. I think Ireland is the key to so many things in relation to Brexit, including VAT. I've just listed there some, some practicalities um, that will occur when the UK leaves the, the EU um, on the face of it, um, certain um, uh, both rights and obligations um, that uh, the UK has and businesses in the UK have in relation to being in the EU will, will go when we, we no longer um, are, are in, the, in, in the EU unless another agreement is done.
So let's get on to some of the, um, the detail um, because you know, we're a little bit, um, we don't have very much detail on, on anything, but at least we now have a, um, a white paper on um, the customs bill. So let's go back. Before I go to this customs uh, bill, I, sorry, this is the one, the one prop I have today is an actual copy of the bill which I'll refer to. So the UK government um, published a, a f what's called a future partnership paper entitled Future Customs Arrangements uh, over the summer. I think it was in August that it was published. And uh, paragraph 54 of this future partnership paper stated, and I quote, without any further facilitations or agreements, the UK would treat trade with the EU as it currently treats trade with non-EU countries. Customs duty and import VAT would be due on EU imports. Traders would need to be registered. Traders exporting to the EU would have to submit an export declaration and certain groups may require an export license. The EU would also apply the customs rules and VAT to imports from the UK that it applies to non-EU countries. The government is actively considering ways in which to mitigate the impacts of such a scenario. Other EU member states will also need to make contingency preparations to mitigate the risk of delays resulting from their own customs processes. It's sort of saying, well, there are certain disadvantages in relation to both customs. There's a lot of focus on, on customs, which in many ways is a more significant issue than uh, VAT. But it's saying, well, you know, we've got quite a good, good deal at the moment. Um, so we'll try and see if there's a way to make that, that deal continue. Uh, the EU then, I can't remember if it was leaked or if it was published, I think it was published, I had a, a position paper uh, in September um, and the response, such as it was, uh, to the future partnership paper was essentially, duh, you're leaving the EU. Now, this is this, is this whole problem, you've probably heard the the phrase that um, our wonderful Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson used saying the, break, the sort of Brexit he wanted, he wanted to, to have his cake and to eat it. We want the advantages, we want, we want to, as if we were in the single market, as if we were in the customs union um, and we want to be able to ensure that only the good people that we want come over the border from the, the EU. Um, that's, that's our ideal Brexit. And so in terms of our customs um, future partnership paper and, and even to an extent the customs bill white paper, the UK is saying that what we really want is to, is to have the similar deal on VAT um, that we have at, at the moment. Um, so there was a bit more detail in the customs uh, paper um, and it looks at, at um, things like the new domestic legislation that the government claims we're going to need. Let me, let me read what it says there. So it says, um, uh, the UK will need new primary legislation irrespective of any agreements reached between the UK and the EU to create a standalone customs regime and to amend the VAT and excise regimes so that they can function effectively after the UK has left the EU. As I say, I think fundamentally the VAT system would work because it works in relation to third countries, and you might have to tinker a little bit around the edges, um, but not, uh, not too much. It goes on to say, customs bill will need to allow the customs VAT and excise regimes to be amended to accommodate changes that are necessary or appropriate in consequence of the UK's withdrawal from the EU with or without an agreement. This includes if the negotiations result in close association with the EU customs union for a time-limited interim implementation period. So this is looking at the the two years and this question about what happens with VAT in that two year period and the question and, and you know we will probably run out of time but we can talk about it later as well is to get some thoughts on, on how the EU is likely to respond to, to some of these, these positions because in a way like no one really wants friction at the border. On the other hand, this is a logical consequence of the decision we made to leave the, um, to leave the EU. Um, so it goes on to say, the government hopes and expects that a positive deal can be reached. I think this is on the, the time-limited 
interim implementation period. So this paper refers to the scenario of the UK leaving the EU without a negotiated outcome on customs, VAT and excise arrangements as a contingency scenario. Except the paper doesn't really go on to look at, at the worst case scenarios, which is the, the no deal. No deal. Um, what is interesting and a, a, a kind of a little bit worrisome in relation to, to VAT and a, a broader constitutional issue is that one of the things about the EU withdrawal bill is it, it contains these so-called Henry VIII powers. And what essentially those are are delegated powers to ministers to be able to make the law. And most countries have these. It's not always practical or necessary for the legislature uh, to make the detailed um, regulations relating to primary legislation. But what the EU withdrawal bill tries to do is to put in place these Henry VIII powers that are quite broad to enable ministers to change fundamental issues of the law uh, relating to, to Brexit. And the justification for this is that we're not going to have a lot of time necessary to make all the changes. There won't be enough parliamentary time. And one of the questions in relation to the progress of the EU withdrawal bill at the moment, which is making its way, it's had two days uh, uh, out of eight of its um, time in the um, committee stage in the full House of Commons. Uh, the government won every single challenge uh, on the vote uh, during that period. Um, but um, one of the things that's likely to be an issue in, when it gets to the House of Lords is how far should these delegated powers go? Because otherwise you've got the ability um, for ministers to be able to um, make changes. They've only got to be vaguely related to Brexit. Well, the reality is in the UK, everything is related to Brexit. So it gives the minister a right to have some sort of um, pass a law which no one would want passed by a minister without um, the, the, the safety checks and without ideally uh, going through the, um, the, the full um, parliament. So on VAT, uh, 4.6, says um, the bill, this is a customs bill, will allow the VAT systems to continue to function whatever the outcome of the negotiations. So, for example, the bill will give the government the flexibility, always worry where you see the word flexibility in relation to government, to give effect to an agreement with the EU on supplies or movements in progress on the day of EU exit and enable supplies or movements of goods and services by businesses and individuals to continue as freely as possible thereafter. And the flexibility to deal with VAT on movements of goods and services between the UK. The, um, so delegated powers is mentioned as well. Um, it says, for tax matters, it's usual practice for secondary legislation to be used to set out rules concerning administration, collection and enforcement of tax. Correct. And for primary legislation to establish a framework around which these rules will be based. The bill will contain appropriate delegated powers and in some cases amend existing powers to allow the government to be able to deliver certain aspects of a negotiated outcome. And um, so what this essentially means is, is that the government thinks that <coughs> there may not be time uh, to be able to get changes to the VAT Act should these be needed if we are treating the EU27 differently from the way we treat US and China. So those powers should unusually be delegated to ministers to be able to make sure that that works to reflect that negotiated outcome. So I think that's what it's getting at, but potentially it enables um, the government to go further than that and make changes to tax legislation with which um, one would not be comfortable as a constitutional matter because tax raising should, tax cutting indeed, should go through um, uh, Parliament and uh, you know it is notable it is not inconceivable that um, uh, uh, even at the time in, in March 29 that the Prime Minister might not be Theresa May but it might be Jeremy Corbyn um, who has um, a rather different attitude towards um, what the UK should look look like I mean at least credit to, to Corbyn although he doesn't really say it but his his vision for the UK he, I mean question about him about whether he actually voted to to leave there's a lot of people think that Jeremy Corbyn voted to leave the EU because he doesn't believe that he can achieve his aim of socialism in one country under things such as state aid rules 
Um, so it's possible that you could have, have someone on the fairly far left who wants to have um, to use these powers in a way that certainly the Conservative minority government at the moment doesn't, um, wouldn't, wouldn't be comfortable uh, with. Um, so those are the delegated powers and some, some questions about whether that will go, get through and if not, how the UK could respond um, flexibly to changes to the VATAP. But of course, you know, it's a two-way thing. I mean, the UK can act unilaterally in relation to VAT on such things as treating import VAT from EU27 as acquisition VAT. But what about the changes on the part of the EU27 that are intended to, to dovetail it? And again, it's this, and I've probably done it today, I've just been talking about the U UK, partly because I'm not going to, to try and get into um, European uh, politics in front of a, a room full of experts. But there is always that tendency to look at this through the, the UK prism. And a lot of the stuff in relation to VAT is going to be work on both sides. Again, this is why Northern Ireland is such a, an issue, because whatever the UK wants to do on Northern Ireland needs to be replicated, one would have thought, in Ireland. And then when the debate gets to the level of, well, we're not going to put any barriers up, is up to the EU if they want to, which is just childish. One thing I'm just going to mention in this um, customs bill just shows some of the, the other challenges. Um, uh, movement of goods by individuals via travel or small parcels. There's a huge amount in here on small parcels, which got mentioned earlier today as well. Um, but for movement of goods by individuals, at the moment you can bring back your booze and your cigarettes and whatever without any limit for personal use. And in the UK we kind of quite like that, uh, filling up the car with uh, alcohol from the Ypres Marche across the, uh, across the channel. And the intention is, seemingly, it's not very well drafted, as a lot of this isn't very well drafted, but it does say uh, the position will ensure that people travelling to the UK from the EU can continue to carry on as they do now, I bring back lots of stuff, and if they do, they will not have to pay any UK tax on the goods that they bring back with them for personal use. So if I come back with a, with a, a MacBook from, from the US, I would say it costs about $2,000 these days. So I cut, fly back from Heathrow. Uh, so I meant to um, declare that, pay the duty, and pay the VAT. Actually, I once declared when I, I went on holiday to Iran about 12 years ago, and I came back with a carpet. It was clear everybody flying from Tehran to London had a carpet. And I was the only person who went through the red line to declare it. And when I declared it, they looked at me like I was insane. And I told them I was a tax lawyer, and they said, OK, we know you have to do this. Um, uh, so, but the intent seems to be that you wouldn't, you go through the red channel with the iPad from the US, MacBook from the US, but it, you don't if you've bought it in, in Paris, uh, although with the pound being so low at the moment that would probably not make very much sense. But how does that then happen in terms of tourist refund schemes? Because from the point of view of, of the French, you're, you're leaving the, the, the UK in the same way you could get go to the US and you can claim back your, your VAT. So does that not lead to the position where it would be in the interest of, of Apple to set up a, a store on just south of the border in Northern Ireland and then you can go and buy your MacBook there and, and effectively get it uh, VAT free? Again, what will the knock-on effect of this sort of policy decision uh, be for EU uh, more, more widely? I just mentioned the creativity point because I'm now, there's this question of, can we do a deal, all of us here now, can we do a deal that means that VAT kind of works in a sensible way when the UK uh, leaves, um, le leaves the EU? Because, of course, it, it's not at the moment quite as binary as it might appear. Um, the Isle of Man is not in the EU, but is basically treated as, as part of the UK for VAT purposes. And I don't know if you've been following the, the Paradise Papers I, Europeans are smiling over there, that worries me. But um, the Isle of Man um, was used for these corporate jet um, um, importations, the, the one in the Paradise Papers involving Lewis Hamilton, uh, where uh, the um, corporate jets could be imported into the, the Isle of Man, which, let's say, has a, a creative um, interpretation of the VAT legislation. Um, and that works because the Isle of Man is, is considered part of the UK and the EU for VAT purposes, so it enters into 
to free circulation. And then you have Gibraltar, which uh, is part of the EU, but is not part of the, the VAT area. Now, that's not to say that, that, there is a, that either of those cases answers the question, um, but um, maybe there is some, some scope to be a little bit creative. Uh, I'm going to mention the Irish border. Uh, this is uh, one bit. I think the, the border here is, is where that um, uh, speed limit sign is. So that's uh, one of them. And this is the Irish border as well. Um, it's at the, um, the bridge is the point of the, uh, the Irish border uh, there. Um, and again, you can... I, I, you can look at the, you know, the Norway-Sweden border. Yeah, you can look at photos of that. Um, uh, of course, this goes much broader than, than VAT. Um, customs is, is, is central, but it issues a regulation of um, immigration and control of borders all, all go to this. But you can start to see why Ireland is such a key issue in relation to, to Brexit. Um, because of the way it is such a porous border, and it always has been, um, and the peace process, I, you know, I cannot claim to be anywhere near an expert on peace process, but it's all been built on the fact that this is what a border looks like. And uh, the economies of, on both sides have been built up on the fact that you can move goods. I think the, the milk that's used for um, Bailey's Irish cream goes across about five, five times and no one cares. No one does any declarations about it. So what do you do? What is your answer when you have to look at the, when you revert to, to import VAT? And even if you can find some way on both sides around the, the VAT arising on import, um, you know, how does that practically work? How can you remove the, the bureaucracy? So that's why... For me, the, the question, we could probably work it out um, without that Irish border, but with the Irish border, it really does um, cause some issues. Um, finally, um, the UK policy choices on, on VAT. So this question, what, what does the UK do with its VAT system when it is, let's assume, no longer required to um, uh, follow the, the 2006 directive in its its um, design. I should say, just an aside. I mean, it, when you when you look, the closer you get to having um, uh, the UK treated as if it were still part of the EU for VAT purposes, I think it's very very hard to do that without then being subject to, to ECJ jurisdiction on interpretation of the VAT and not allowing the UK to move away from VAT, not uh, otherwise than in accordance with the 2006 directive. So the UK would have to do a deal whereby it couldn't have differential rates in, in Northern Ireland uh, for tourism. Um, and I don't think that would, is something that would be capable of being sold in, in the UK. So let's assume that we, we do leave and, and whatever the deal is in relation to trade with the EU on VAT, we just stick with it. Um, what does the UK use its newfound freedom uh, to do? Um, well, I, I mentioned earlier about the, the, the gimmicks. Uh, I mean, w people don't get that um, excited about VAT and um, restrictions and what the UK can do. Uh, the cases on things like Jaffa cakes just kind of makes us laugh, really. Um, the women's sanitary products, in fact, there's VAT on uh, women's sanitary products, um, uh, sometimes gets um, people a little bit animated. It's tiny, we're talking tiny amounts of money, and I get that that's not the point. And occasionally that gets mentioned by those in, in favour of, of leaving the EU as a reason for, for doing it. Um, but I think we could, we, we could expect to see some more zero rating, some more narrowing of the base, which is a, a, something politicians like to do. Um, but in terms of the design of VAT, it's not really a, a very good idea. One of the um, discussions in the run-up to the budget was whether the UK would look to reduce its VAT threshold, which is a ludicrously high 85,000. Um, and that has a significant effect on, um, uh, on small businesses, because if you're a plumber, um, you can earn a very nice 
living doing £84,000 worth of um, business a year. Um, and indeed, a lot of plumbers uh, will work until they get to that, that um, amount, and then they'll go, go on holiday for a couple of months. And you know, I haven't looked at the detail on it, but it's not inconceivable that may uh, form a, um, in part, um, result in um, the, the low growth that we've seen, low productivity growth that we've seen in, in, in recent years, because we have a lot of self-employed people and those who are supplying to uh, consumers are massively incentivized not to go above that, that threshold. But again, that's politically difficult. Um, Philip Hammond did freeze the rate. Typically, it's gone up, so he froze it and sort of hinted that the UK may look at its VAT system in two years. He didn't mention Brexit again, but I don't think that April 2019 um, and, uh, date was entirely coincidental. Um, so it, is, is that a hint that the UK may look at reinventing uh, VAT? Um, could it see that in terms of trying to get uh, a competitive uh, advantage? It leads me to my final question uh, about tax havens, because I've mentioned Jeremy Corbyn, who wants socialism in one country. And then you do get people, and there's a leaked letter from Boris Johnson and Michael Gove that did again, very strongly um, suggest that their vision for the UK after Brexit is, is to become a tax haven, it's to become Singapore, probably more like Hong Kong, but they, they're used interchangeably by people who don't really know the difference. But the, um, the idea of having a low tax economy on the, um, on the shores of the, of the EU. And uh, so again, at least they're relatively honest, at least on that point. Um, but that's always focusing on things like the, the rate of um, corporation tax uh, or our rules in relation to non-domiciles. Um, there's a question of, is, could the UK seek to use VAT when it's no longer bound by EU laws as a mechanism to compete on tax? And if it did, final question is, is to what extent the EU would try to stop the UK? Um, Thank you very much uh, for listening so attentively. And um, uh, I'm not sure if we take questions now or, or, or when we finish at the end of the, the day, but um, uh, I'm sure there'll be lots to talk about over dinner later. Thank you very much.